I was awarded the Frieder Guard Prize a couple of weeks ago in Germany and uh, I arranged a set of seminars on my approach to economics and uh, we gave some of the seminars but others weren't recorded so this is a catch up that I'm doing. And just to uh, give a bit of background to the Frieder Guard Prize, uh, prizes like the Nobel Prize in economics which is not a Nobel, uh, it would reward people who accept the neoclassical religion, uh, the Frieder Guard basically rewards those who are heretics in the profession. It was established in 2021 and uh, it rewards achievements that further the development of an economics of sustainability. And what I'm doing in these lectures and, and workshops is explaining my approach as well as my critique of mainstream economics and also uh, then how do I try to develop an alternative. I've built a software package called Minsky and I'll give a few workshops on how to use Minsky for realistic monetary and uh, modelling of the economy, and also how you take a look at the role of energy in production, which has been omitted by mainstream economists, and fundamentally, because, because of that, Western civilization, human civilization in general, is energy blind, blind to the importance of energy in our society, blind to the consequences of using the amount that we have, and what's going to happen when we, when we can no longer do that. Now, my basic criticism of mainstream economics is one that goes back uh, well before I became a critic, and that is that it's neat, it's plausible, and it's wrong. And it, every last element can be pulled apart on that ground. Uh, so, for example, an essential part of mainstream economics is the argument that there's a rising supply curve. The basis of that rising supply curve is diminishing marginal productivity, and when you take a look at the real, the real world, that simply doesn't apply in modern industrial capitalism. Marginal costs therefore fall with output and you can't generate a supply curve from marginal cost curves. Uh, the Cobb-Douglas production function, which is the, the go-to tool that most economists use for their mathematical modelling at the macroeconomic level, modelling of consumption as well, it's a tautology. And it's also an unnecessary complication because once you bring in the role of energy, the entire foundations change as well. Consumers are supposed to be what they call rational and the definition of rational is, is obeying a set of rules which are called the axioms of revealed preference. Uh, they have been shown not to, be, not to apply in a real world case of individuals making a limited number of choices uh, to supposedly to maximise their utility. They have breached all of those axioms. And even if people did behave that way, the idea that you can derive a market demand curve which has the, has the uh, same shape as individual demand curves the argument being there that the higher the price, the less people demand, that can't be done. So neoclassical theory can't explain a crucial part of their own theory. Uh, so therefore, supply and demand analysis is impossible. Uh, fundamentally, they're equivalent to the theories that chemists used to have about uh, what caused fire, which is this mythical substance called phlogiston. We had to throw that out. We should throw out the whole foundations of neoclassical microeconomics. Even if the micro made sense, which I'm arguing here it doesn't, you can't derive macroeconomics from micro because of what's called complexity and emergent properties. And the macro that the mainstream has done leave out the role of money, banks and debt completely. You can't do that. And I'll, that's one of the first things I'll cover in these lectures, uh, that you simply have to include the role of money to understand aggregate demand and aggregate income in capitalism. Now, that's where I'm going to start, because uh, the same week that I was awarded the, uh, well, the week before I was awarded the uh, Frieder Guard Prize, I found that Ben Bernanke was getting the fake Nobel Prize. So let's start with the role of money in capitalism. Now, if you, I know this is quite a shock for people who haven't studied economics, because the, the conventional feeling as well, the economy is all about money, therefore an economist or experts on the economy, therefore they must know all about money. Ironically, and this goes back to Jean-Baptiste Say back in the early 1800s, neoclassical economists convinced themselves that money actually gets in the way of understanding the economy. So their models have no banks in them, no private debt and no credit. And what they say is the money is just a veil over barter. If you lift the veil, you can see the face you're looking at uh, much more clearly. So let's get rid of money completely. But then, of course, they get to pontificate on money because they're supposed to be the experts on it. 
Now, it's only true that you, that you can strip away money and, and see things more clearly if money itself has no significant impact upon the macro economy, if it doesn't affect income and expenditure. And that's what the neoclassical model of banking does. It's called loanable funds. And it says banks are intermediaries between savers and borrowers. And if you consult the documents on the uh, Nobel Prize Award to Bernanke and his two, uh, two mates, uh, you'll find that that's exactly what they say. Banks are intermediaries between savers and borrowers. They take in funds from savers, they then lend them out to borrowers and charge an interest rate for the, for the process. And unless there's huge differences between the demand propensities of savers and borrowers, there won't be much change to aggregate demand coming out of it, so you can basically ignore it. And this was the reason that Bernanke rejected Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory of Great Depressions in the paper that he was given the Nobel Prize for, specifically the paper that they identified as his major contribution to the role of banks in causing financial crises. Now, what he argued in that paper, it's a long paper, but this is the part that I focus upon, is that he dismissed Fisher's idea that what, what, what Fisher called debt deflation caused the Great Depression, because he said debt deflation represented no more than a redistribution from one group, debtors, to another group, creditors, and absent and plausibly large differences in their propensity to spend, pure redistributions, and that's what they see lending as, should have no significant macroeconomic effects. Well, it's a fallacy, because when you look at the real world clearly, credit in adds to aggregate demand and income. And you can derive it directly from the, an essential uh, identity in economics that one person's expenditure becomes another person's income. If you go buy a coffee at the local coffee shop, that's an expenditure by you. The money you give to the uh, coffee shop owner is income for the, for the uh, uh, recipient. So that is an absolutely critical identity in macroeconomics. And what I've done to show that credit adds to aggregate demand in the context of a, a banking system which creates money by creating loans uh, is to divide the economy into X sectors. If X was everybody in the society, all people and all companies, then you would then get the whole aggregate demand identified that way. Um, of course, I can't put a table that big on screen, so I, I work with a, a simplified version showing three sectors. And what I show on, in the, what I'm calling a Moore table in honour of Basil Moore, one of my predecessors as a rebel in economics, is that each row shows expenditure. So by the spender and the recipient of the money. And therefore, each row must sum to zero. Uh, the vertical shows the income uh, uh, minus expenditure for each individual in the system. So when you look at this table, and I'll show this in a moment, it'll, it'll clarify what I'm talking about abstractly here. The negative of the sum of the diagonal is aggregate expenditure. The sum of the off-diagonal elements is aggregate income, and they are necessarily equal. Now, let's just look at the simplest case here. Imagine a world like Milton Friedman's fictional world for his optimal quantity of money paper, where there's no lending and there's no banking. You simply have a certain number of notes circulating through the economy. So what I have is a three-sector view. I have households, services, and manufacturing. Uh, spending, and that's the horizontal. It's just like an arrow cake. So there's spending, spending by households uh, reduces the holdings of cash by households by A dollars per year, which they spend on services, and B dollars per year, which they spend on manufacturing, and the sum of a minus A minus B plus A plus B is necessarily zero. Services spend C dollars per year on households and D dollars per year on manufacturing. Manufacturing spends E dollars per year on households and F dollars per year on services. And necessarily, each row sums to zero, and the aggregate also sums to zero. Individual elements within there can take in more cash than they spend out. So C plus E, which is the income households get, can be greater than A plus B, which is the spending they do. But the aggregate of that also has to be zero. Now, when you then do those sums, that's what you find. The negative of the diagonal minus minus A minus B, blah, 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 is equal to A plus B, blah, blah, blah. So that's the simple illustration of how a Moore table works. Now, the bank, we're now going to bring in banking, but I'm going to start with the myth that neoclassical economists wish to continue believing that banks are just intermediaries between savers and borrowers. 
So what is then happening is that the banking sector, which I'm calling part of the services sector, lends money to households and households then spend that money on manufacturing. So what you have is uh, that services still is spending C dollars per year on households as before, and I've simplified everything to say that it all affects the manufacturing sector, uh, but they're spending D minus credit dollars per year on manufacturing, uh, and they're then making a transfer of credit dollars per year from their bank accounts to the household bank accounts. So that's, that transfer is shown diagonally because borrowing money or lending money is not a sale. Okay? All, this, all the sales stuff occurs horizontally. You're transferring cash out of your bank account and giving it to somebody else. Why do you do that? Because you're going to charge them interest. So the interest income goes to services as well. Uh, and then what I've got, and again, to make this a simple example to see, I've got the households having borrowed credit dollars per year from the, uh, from the services sector, spend credit dollars per year on the manufacturing sector. Now, that therefore changes what the aggregate sums are and so on. And now if we do the same exercise that I showed for a fictional world in which there is no banking and show it for this fictional world where banks are just intermediaries, credit cancels out. Notice that there's a negative entry, uh, actually you'll, you'll work through a negative entry for credit up here, a positive entry for credit down there, they cancel out. We have a negative entry for credit here, a positive entry for credit there, they cancel out. What doesn't cancel out is we have a new transaction between sectors, households pay interest dollars per year to the service sector, so interest turns up as part of aggregate expenditure, which is what is there, and part of ag aggregate income, which is what it is there. So credit cancels out, there's no role for credit in aggregate demand and income, and that's the world that neoclassicals would like to believe that we live inside. Now what about the real world? And uh, in, in the academic profession, the area that I've worked on used to be called endogenous money, which only means something to people who actually work in the field. So my preferred uh, acronym and, and term to express the real world, is we live in a world where banks originate money and debt. Got a great acronym, BOMBED. Let's see what happens when you live in a world where you get bombed. Well, what happens there is, and I'll explain the details when I start building Minsky models later in, the, in this series of lectures, is that banks lend credit dollars per year to households, which so far looks like loanable funds. Uh, households spend credit per year on manufacturing, also looks like loanable funds. But the way that it's done is, the credit adds to the assets of the banking sector and adds to the liabilities at the same time. So the banks lend you credit dollars per year and they add that to the amount of outstanding debt. That then creates money in the bank account of households, which they spend. Nobody borrows for the, <laughs> trust me, if you don't know this yourself already, nobody borrows for the sheer pleasure of being de in debt. It's the thing you want to avoid. Um, you, you do it because you have to, uh, not because you want to be in debt. Okay, so when you borrow money, you borrow to spend. So credit dollars per year is borrowed by households and credit dollars per year is spent by manufacturing. Now, you then pay the interest. The interest gets paid to a fourth sector. I'm now treating the banking sector as an independent additional sector outside services. So the banks are lending the money because they get paid interest. The loan increases their assets and increases the liability. Households now have credit dollars per year more to spend on manufacturing. And when you do the take the sum of the, the negative of the diagonals, or add up the off-diagonal elements, credit appears. The reason being that credit appears only once as a negative, which is the sum of the negatives, that's it turning up here, as part of aggregate expenditure, and only once as a positive expenditure on manufacturing. So credit adds to both aggregate expenditure and aggregate income. And the same thing continues to apply if you expand it beyond looking just at the, uh, the, the uh, real world of buying and selling goods and services and include buying and selling assets as well. We just need to expand the, the definition. So credit does not cancel out in the real world. And one of the reasons credit is so important is, unlike expenditure, it can be negative. And that's what happened during the global financial crisis. Now, there's overwhelming empirical evidence for this, and I'm going to show it using a program that I'm develop developing that I hope to release sometime later this year as a commercial extension to Minsky. 
And this enables me to analyze the data of a large number of countries at once. So I've taken a sample here of countries that had an extreme uh, impact of the global financial crisis back in 2008 on the economy. So here's the level of private debt for the American economy, growing from about 1 to 60 percent of GDP back in the early 1940s to 170 percent at the crisis, then falling and now rising again with the um, uh, COVID outbreak. The black line down here is credit as a percentage of GDP. It peaked at 15% of GDP in 2007. It fell to minus, almost minus 5% in 2010. And what I'm plotting as well is the unemployment rate. And what happens is when credit is, is high, unemployment falls. When credit is low, unemployment rises. And you can see they've negatively, massively negatively correlated with each other. Now, going back to Bernanke, he said that pure redistributions should have no significant macroeconomic effects. That's true, but credit is not a pure redistribution. It is a pure creation of new spending power. And because it can go from massively positive to massively negative, that's why credit dominates macroeconomics. Neoclassical economists leave it out of their picture, which is why they don't understand the macroeconomy. Now, that's the United States. Let's just take a look at a couple of other countries. Is the UK. Not quite as obvious. The beauty of America, as, a, as an example, is it's almost self contained. Even though there's a huge amount of international trade, it's the most self sufficient uh, economy on the planet. So you don't get complicating factors from uh, the, the trade balance as much as you do for other countries. Here is Spain, which had the biggest boom and crash during the financial crisis. Uh, the change in debt actually exceeded 30% in GDP and went down to minus 20%. That's why Spain had such an enormous crisis. Let's see who the next we've got on here. Portugal, again, the same sort of negative correlation, the same huge boom, more than 30%, down to minus 10 in credit. New Zealand, not quite as obvious, but still the same basic pattern. Japan, and here we have Japan's economy falling apart when their bubble economy ended back in 1990. The plunge in credit from, again, about 25% of GDP down to less than minus 10 caused for Japan a huge increase in the unemployment rate. So this pattern applies in all the major economies on the planet. Uh, there are variations from one country to another depending upon whether they create their own currency or not and other factors of that nature. But the, the empirical data is overwhelming. Credit matters to aggregate demand. Neoclassicals are still ignoring it, not only after the financial crisis, but even after the Bank of England came out and said the rebels like me were correct and the mainstream is wrong. So what I want to now show is, having acknowledged that, uh, that money matters, how do we build monetary models of the economy? And that's where I uh, invented a program called Minsky which is open source and free. You can download it from um, SourceForge. In fact, I think I could explain a bit of this here. Let's take a look. So you can download Minsky from this location. It'll take you about a minute to install it. And there are manuals, very, very rough manuals at the moment. I hope to improve them over time. Uh, but I've got them both on this one web page. There's a short manual, which is a, a bit of a how-to guide. Um, and there's a longer manual, which is a bit of a rant on macroeconomics as well. So they're all available to teach you how to use Minsky. But the best tuition is supplied by a, a, a absolute maestro at using uh, Minsky, Tyrone Keynes, who's established a YouTube channel called Modeling with Minsky. And if you really want to get your head around what you can do with Minsky and how to lay out models very, very clearly, watch some of Ty's videos there.